I work as a data engineer and most projects I'm either build the data infrastructure or building the data platform. The most recent projects I was involved either with Snowflake or Databricks, working on Azure, AWS, and a bit of GCP. Because I used to work, I know that you're interested in Databricks in particular, and I used to work in Microsoft Gaming, where I was implementing Databricks Delta Lake from scratch. It was barely fresh approach. It was around like 2021, before we had HD Insight and Hive, and also is a staging area, and then SQL Server uh, on premise with uh, integration service where it like just running the fact tables and connecting to Power BI. The idea was to unify everything together because Hive, for example, on HD Insight, we had the problem. So just the single cluster with compute, for example, with new release of the game or updates, which might be peak. And if you want to increase the size, you need to stop the cluster, change the configurations and restart. Whereas in Databricks, you just can have different kinds of uh, clusters. You can have the auto scale. That's also like one of the benefits. But the biggest benefit, just moving everything together and then using the Delta Lake approach that is convenient for most of our data because it was telemetry. We used append. We didn't really do like merge. And also the volume of data was pretty big just to doing the merge. For the fact tables, they use the, the merge. What data volumes have you handled in your data engineering work? I think uh, daily, because it was partitioned hourly, one hour of data might have like, I don't know, like 40, 20 gigabytes of data. Usually what I do with this big volume of data, never do like, you know, backfield, just trying to run like the whole month or like the whole year. So trying to find the minimum partition size, and then I can iteratively work on this. In this case, uh, it was one hour of data, size could be like 20, 40 gigabytes, and then just parsing it uh, through like medallion architecture, bronze, silver, just simple append modes through the data frames. It was fully idem patent, so it means like if you restart it anytime you want, you won't face any issue with duplicates. Basically, the data will clean before it's inserting. Describe the data ingestion process for telemetry data from gaming consoles and mobile apps. The data, you can split it in two biggest buckets. One of them that I was working is the game telemetry. It's actually from game itself. The gaming console data we had as well, especially financial data, like Game Pass and all transactions, but it was managed by the core Xbox team. So I was part of the studio and I was only as a leverage their primary, like the main Microsoft uh, data lake that was size like 15 petabytes, but it holds everything. It's gaming, Windows, all kinds of things. They give you interface to interact with this, so you can dump the data from this huge like data lake. Also, it's partition with data feeds. You can build the automation pipeline to drop it into your storage account. And I also did uh, the project. There was integrations with Databricks. I basically installed a special library that will grant access because it's still the same blob storage. So it grants the access and then I can, my Spark cluster is able to read and do the same things, but from like external data lake. The primary data source is telemetry games itself. And the backend team, like game developers, they set up the service that basically collected all telemetry and processed telemetry from all players who are playing the game almost in real time. And then they write to blob storage and I work close in JSON format, in JSON GZIP. I work close with them to actually let them know what kind of format I expect. I offer them, I want folder structure, year, month, date, hour. And basically you're going to write in our things, uh, all the JSON files. And then I will, from Databricks, I will come every hour and look to the previous hour folder take all the JSON files, process it with Spark, and create my first bronze table. Because it is JSON file, the idea why I split between bronze and silver, 
because it has nested elements. Basically, it has the five columns always the same. It could be like server timestamp, like ID, whatever. But the body of the file is actually has the nested structure. In bronze, I basically just five columns writing as is quickly. And then, depends on the requirements, I create staging tables based on the nested structures. It could be like, I don't know, shooting activity, walking activity, any kind of activity. I can filter my initial table. And I have extra column I just derive event type that help me to filter the certain events. And then I can apply the schema for the JSON and build the staging table dedicated to this particular activity. How do you handle schema changes in the bronze layer, particularly adding new columns and backfilling data? I think to add new column is not a big deal. You can just alter the table and data frame to modify from just a single pull request. The bigger questions if we would need to do the backfill. Assuming I, I miss the column and I have like, I don't know, a couple months of data, or terabytes of data, how I will do the backfill. For me, it's the biggest challenge. Uh, I think in Databricks, you might do automatic schema discovery, schema evolution. In case if I expect my schema will change from time to time, I can automatically probably mark some parameters. I didn't do this. There is the opportunity to automatically like to extend the bronze table by adding like new columns there. How do you ensure data completeness for a specific hour in streaming data, especially when dealing with potential delays and inconsistencies in server timestamps? We, we had this challenge. That's why that's why we had two timestamps. Ex exactly the same challenge. We have two timestamps. One is um, what time telemetry was created on the player console, and the second, like the server timestamp, was actually get it and process. And we just agree with the team that I gonna use the server process because I partitioned by the service process. So then the data was landed into JSON. Then their backend service processed this data. Even if it, this data was generated day ago, but it's landed today, last hour, it will come to this partition. So just my assumption, what we did with the team to simplify the process, that we will use the main timestamp of event creation when the backend service actually processes this and get the telemetry from console, not the time that it was generated. Other ways, exactly, I will face the issue how I going to get all those events and add them to the existing partitions and what I going to do. With Delta Lake, it's possible, so I can probably just insert and update this, but to simplify this, I just use the server timestamp. How do you satisfy consumer needs for consistent timestamps when the initial data ingestion relies on server timestamps that can be affected by factors like clock skew or daylight saving time adjustments? Because I still have this uh, creation timestamp um, event. And because I have the silver and bronze layers, they are partitioned by server timestamp, just the way how a data is coming. But the fact tables, the gold layer, it's actually very different structure because we use some window functions. We will process the data down. I, I don't remember exactly. It will be last 30 days. So just assumptions that we we expect that like player sessions or other events last 30 days, we process everything and then we can swap the partition column or event column that makes sense for end users and consumers. It has two columns. They understand the difference. It's very important thing in the gaming and they have the choice. Honestly, I don't remember which one I choose, but it totally makes sense for me to use the event processing when it was uh, generated by the customer. For fact tables, I used absurd or merge. I don't remember exactly, but I didn't use this simple append insert delete method. Use this absurd and merge. Uh, based on the primary key and for some tables i was able like fully reload them we aggregated the data so data volume is smaller in the silver layer with staging tables it's just a subset of the logs for particular events that i use in fact tables the data volume way smaller that in some case i can just simply reload the full table if you wanted to add a layer to enforce a contract between data producers and consumers ensuring a partition is closed for writing before consumption how would you implement it? This good question, because for me, I don't have visibility. It's not like a you know, relation database or you know, Salesforce where you can al always compare. Here, it just assumption that the backend team is giving me all the data. The things that I can control is the size of partition the number of rows I'm getting, just to make sure that, for example, number of rows I'm getting now 
is more or less the same as number of I get in last hour or maybe the average between last like 24 hours and maybe the same hour last day. Those simple checks I can do what I can control, but based on just this empiric approach to look what was in the past, what I get now. So if, for example, we get some outliers uh, where it's like big spike of the logs that can trigger alert or there is actual too few logs. But there is no way for me to actually compare what was. And maybe, again, it, it would depend on backend team if they set up some kind of systems where it can tell me what the volume of events they process or they expect to process, then I can look up. But we didn't implement anything like this. I can suggest ideas, but <laughs> the implementations of them, if, if I know that how many active players we have, and basically what's number of my endpoints I'm collecting, I know what's the length of the game based on the hours. So I can estimate what my telemetry size should come. Based on this, I can estimate the number of logs I should collect and then compare against this. It's based on those like estimations, but there is another question how you're going to implement this to collect extra information from the games. Also, you can maybe do a deep dive in historical patterns for, because the, the game used to release different titles. So you can look to the past title before launch the new one and see the patterns and know what to expect in terms of the data. For me, ideally, I need to verify again something and this something should be set up in backend. And as soon as I load to my partitions, then I can evaluate that this number makes sense. I need some kind of endpoint there. Okay, I can send the API request and make sure it makes sense. I think even Parquet itself, if you're writing in the Parquet, it has this file by default. Recently, I work with Amplitude service. It had the same. It has data feeds, the exporting data in the storage. As soon as it's done with the feed or article like date, it also writes the file that it, it's over. What was the most challenging problem you've solved as a data engineer? And why was it particularly challenging? The biggest challenge I had with open source services Recently, I work with services like Arbyte, Arflor, hosted through the Kubernetes. The challenge I had there, I just wasn't able to deliver. So I have my business task, as you may understand what should be done and how it should be done. But I just constantly face the issues with open source, I don't know, authentication method not, not supporting by, then I want to consume data from Google Analytics or maybe I need to scale this or I have security concerns. So this is why I like from Databricks because it's managed service. So I have less those problems that I need fighting than like four weeks. I can trying to solve one problem just to solve the configuration. There is no documentation, there is no proper use case, there is no support. You on your own and you have pressure to deliver. Probably in my career, my biggest challenge is related to the open source. I used to focus on the problem solving in terms of if the business needs the data, and I know there is the source of the data, so I built the pipeline, I deliver the data, do the checks, the documentations, but if at the same time I need actually to troubleshooting this open source service, they're delivering this and it's uncontrollable and it's no documentation, so it's legacy code or tech debt, then I feel like this is challenging for me a lot. Another challenge with Databricks, obviously the telemetry coming in real time streaming. I decided to use Delta streaming. This example will be applicable for all streaming solution. Delta streaming, uh, it is nice. You can just provide the configurations and then you expect your cluster is running and it's just consuming all the JSON files that generated in the source. The problem that I faced, sometimes my Delta stream failed. So it's using Apache Spark like structure streaming, sometimes it failed. And then I had extremely hard time to uh, recover it. The checkpoints that it has somehow not valid. In many cases, I need just to completely restart. I had conversations with Databricks support. It was the new feature. Eventually I just decided to stay away from streaming. That's why the streaming solutions, they have own complexity. And for many cases, especially because I mostly work in the field with data lake, data warehouse, with the BI consumers outside or machine learning team, they don't need real-time data. Then I can design the systems in the batch mode just to 
deliver data every hour just to avoid this complexity. As soon as I started work with streaming, there are so many questions how to recover the data, who is doing on call because it's 24 by 7, do we really need urgent data? If you encounter scaling problem, how will you address this? Depends on the stack I'm using. So I have examples for Trino. I, I have example, recent project I worked with was the Trino, but because it was open source that hosted on Kubernetes, it has basically a number of uh, pods workers was predefined. As soon as our data grew up, our query start failing. You can see that it's not enough memory, just not enough query concurrency. The first thing I implemented is partition because then a joint project, we had the iceberg data lake. All the tables never had partitions. As a result, it contributed to this like slowdown. So in, it improved query latency for some time. But again, the data continued to grow. The next step was just to double the size of the workers. I think two to five. And then each worker size just the double to the bigger one to handle this. And this is the simplest way for me to solve the problem by doubling the compute. In Databricks, I had often situations then especially doing some kind of backfill. If I need to backfill long range of data, I don't want to go over each hour. I want to run like one month at a time, one day at a time. Obviously, my existing clusters do not handle for this. For this case in Databricks, I can just create temporary cluster, the bigger size with out of scale mode to make sure that my backfill will, will work and then just destroy it. It's very important to look to the query plan and see what, what kind of things happen and where the problem is happening. If I have one job that succeeded in Databricks, another job is failed, then I can go into, I think, Spark metrics and find the job and see what's input data volume. I had cases with end users who are trying to run the queries and they told me, you know, it was working yesterday, but not working today. And then I compare two queries. I can clearly see that input data increase a lot. The answer, yeah, you, you just have more data. If you have many joins, there is a uh, more complicated techniques, like what you can do. How can you avoid the shuffling? How we can avoid to moving data between clusters? Can you cache something? Maybe you can split to intermediate tables. Maybe you can simply review your partition structure. How do you troubleshoot performance issues when end users complain about slow query performance in an analytics environment like Amazon Athena? Athena in particular, very interesting uh, example because I had one project, it was fully built on Athena Data Lake and DBT. Because Athena, first of all, is the service that you're not able to scale up. The first thing what I do, okay, I, I go into the query itself and trying to see the query plan, estimate what it's doing. In my experience, the query failing in Athena that has many joins, and especially if it has some one particular issue we had, the users calculate some time series for financial metrics, and they cross join with calendar. It always blow up the whole data set. As soon as I see this kind of like, weird pattern in the SQL, I can suggest users to avoid this and come up with workaround. The second thing, if I open an article about AWS best practices for Athena, it will tell me, look to the partition, look to the bucketing. I can see how I can implement this structure. One thing works really well. How would you prevent users from querying the wrong partitions and creating terabytes of incorrect data in Databricks, similar to how you controlled costs in Snowflake using workgroup limits? If I have partition by date, then I can try to ask user to limit the range, the data that they're scanning. The goal, obviously, for me to make sure that the user scan the least possible data. If nothing works, then I can suggest users to create pre-aggregated tables, take care for these aggregations based on the requirements they need. In the past, I had example, it was the Trino. We had one table that have many partners in their metrics. The challenge was that the data was too big just to process. Trina is very similar to Athena, but you just control the, the, the clusters and, and everything. And what I did, I created the metrics tables. Each individual metric was in individual table. And I pre-calculated this for the users. And because we use Metabase, Metabase doesn't have any caching, any extracts. It's basically just executing direct SQL queries. Before we had the dashboards with like 20 different charts. 
and it starts looking to particular metric. You issue 20 different queries to the same big table. Then I create the metrics table. I had 20 smaller tables that has particular metrics and has particular partition structure. And then each chart was connected to this metric table. It increased like latency a lot. It was like extremely fast. I just added one more layer on top of my bigger table. Can you share any case studies or examples where you optimize costs by rebuilding or re-architecting a data pipeline to reduce compute and storage expenses? The cost-related topics, I have two examples. One is the very frequent one, even with Athena, because we used Athena in dbt. Every time then you run dbt model on Athena, in most cases it will fully reload the data. And you have the same table name, the same metadata, but the folder location will be different. Run the query, save result in the new location that it created by itself, and it's abandoned the old one. Over the time, you have a bunch of data that basically your previous dbt models, and it's never clean up. The one thing I did, and for storage, it works really well. Then I work in the lake house, the data lake, and I have decoupled like the tables and the storage. What I do, I basically use the Python to go over metadata from each table, extract their location, their actual location, S3 location, where is the data right now sits for this table. At the same time, I scanning the whole S3 bucket where my data lake sits and identify all S3 locations that doesn't attach to metadata. Those obvious, then I have the things that I can delete. And the example was, uh, we had uh, on Athena data lake, then I asked DevOps what was the size. They told me, you know, like based on the S3 bucket size, it's 50 terabytes. And I ran this test. I identified that actual data lake size is eight terabytes. Only four is productions and another four is dev. This is the answer. It means another 40 terabytes of data just could be deleted. I just set up the job that can do it this on the schedule once a month. And this works with everything. You have separated job that's scanning your data lake like storage and identify everything that's abandoned. Uh, in other options, you can set up the lifecycle policy that it also works really well and it just will delete everything that's outdated. In terms of compute, either you have Databricks uh, clusters or Snowflake clusters and Snowflake in particular likes to consume a lot of credits and very expensive. There are techniques how you can optimize. First, you need to make sure that for your workload, you have the right size of the cluster. The cluster could be too big for your work and it's just not utilized. And I think in Databricks, there are like a bunch of blog posts and query examples, how you can analyze what's your utilization for the clusters to, to make sure that you have the good size of the cluster and the cost is good. In Amazon, uh, the cost was a big topic for us. Every second week, we review with some senior level engineers the cost across the org. You also have to budget the cost upfront. If you have anything outside of like you just bump the cost, you need to dive deep into billing, understand what this cost could be this avoid and why the budget is wrong. Storage and computer are two primary things how to optimize. Then you work with BI users. They really like to run the queries, don't apply the filters. They just want to query like everything they can tell. I need all, all data. I don't want any aggregation. I want raw item level data that consume a lot of cost. It's easy to set up the alert that will send you list of queries and users who have like the most expensive queries. I implemented this in Snowflake environment. Every week we monitor the cost. And we have the dashboard in Looker that looks to to all the queries, what's the most expensive queries, who did those queries, and so on and so on. So you, if it's you see it's business users, you can fill up. Then I did this in Microsoft Databricks. I didn't care about the cost because I was part of Microsoft. We have really good discount. The cost wasn't the issue. The first thing, if I go to the bill billing, I can identify how much it cost for me daily i can have the tags for the clusters so i can go down to a particular cluster to identify how much money it's spending is it reasonable or not i don't know the answer but i assume the databricks itself have some kind of metadata that will tell me the 
consumption patterns. How many queries run per cluster so I can see even how many concurrent queries, how long the queries run. I bet this information available in Databricks. And basically I can analyze this. I can build some kind of like BI dashboard on top of this data to see anything that looks strange. We, we look weekly into this and we even don't have alerts. Yeah, it's basically reactively, yeah. The thing that you mentioned about workloads groups, Snowflake, we have the warehouse clusters and the clusters has uh, timeouts. The query has the timeouts that you can control. For example, if it's not ETL specific or for business users, it's just 30 minutes, the query. The second clouds, I don't think in Snowflake we use any workload. So I used to use the, these workloads patterns for Redshift and, uh, and Athena because it's like single threaded. So you have just one, one way to submit the queries and you have like concurrency running queries. That's why workloads is important. In Snowflake and Databricks, because you, you have a bunch of compute clusters, you can, for each particular, like for BI users, for example, marketing, you have, they have their own cluster size and you can control the cost and you can have limitations of the cluster. I know that some companies, they going crazy about this. They set up like governance framework about this. Your queries go through some validations before you're going to submit. In the big organizations, you, you have the budgeting and the cloud cost is important. That's why they're trying to prevent this to make sure that you not submit anything crazy. I know that for some ways, you can even use the simple like pull request and code reviews procedures. So if you come up with some query that you want to set up and run daily or build the dashboards, you can call for code review the data engineers that they can make sure you don't do anything crazy like cross joins in your query. And the overall like query plan is working fine. Why and when did you switch to a data lake? First of all, the reason why I started to use Delta Lake before we had in Amazon, we have the data, uh, data lake with Elastic Map Reduce and Spark with simple parquets. And we faced exactly this issue with GDPR. We couldn't delete the particular customer ID who requests deletion. And the options we had either to keep like 90 days of data or completely reload the data or trying to do some weird thing with partitions, somehow like partition by group of customers that you can only reload this partition. Idea of data lake that it gives ability us to delete particular customer ID. In my case, working in Microsoft and Amazon, organizations on the high level provide you kind of like endpoint where you can listen and just get the list of customers ID that re request deletion. And then you do either delete completely delete them from all the tables. So you need to know where the customer ID exists and what data are associated to them. The main goal is to make sure the data are unidentifiable to the person. You can basically just uh, hash this customer ID one way and you, you still have the, this customer ID, you can count this, but this is unidentifiable. So that's alternative way. In my case, I did real deletion. It was just delete operations based on the list of the customer's ID and it was running once a week. It's exactly like delete from the table where like customer ID in the list. What would you prefer to work with, Athena or Databricks? I definitely will go with Databricks as the most mature product and reach of the features. The First of all, DBT for Athena is not official uh, connector. As a result, it doesn't really support Iceberg. I think iceberg format and then incremental loads is the issue. So I would never go one more time with Athena and DBT. The second, Athena, for me, Athena, the first order is good if you want to explore the data in S3. I know now Athena introduced the PySpark, but again, just today I faced the issue with Athena PySpark that I have limitations on number of DPU I can use, and it's uh, probably hard limitations because it's just the service and versus Databricks, I can still control the cluster and I control a lot of things. And Databricks is a platform. I can integrate it with, uh, I don't know, GitHub for the code reviews. I can use like either streaming. I can easily work with machine learning team. I have the SQL endpoints to build some simple visualizations or grant the access to the end users. At the same time, 
in Databricks we have this airbag, so we can control role-based access, who can access what. It's easy to add the users. It, for me, just Databricks can solve everything. Versus Athena is a very particular solution. Well, in Databricks, you even can control ingestion of the data. In first order, Athena for me is a SQL engine. You need like separated process that, I don't know, Fivetran, Airbyte, that will ingest the data in S3, and then you can read this with Athena. What are areas for improvement for Databricks? Maybe just to how they starting using uh, generative AI. This is more like just the f nice to have features, but I wouldn't use them in production. The one thing I found handy is a um, AI assistant in case that then you have failure and it's already suggest you like how to solve the issue. The generative AI things and Databricks, I don't think they yet mature. Then I used to implement Databricks. I really had the troubles. What you can easily implement in Snowflake using this role-based access control. Like you have the roles, you have the users. You can really fine grain. And you also in Snowflake, you have data masking dynamic data masking based on the role. In Databricks, you don't have this dynamic data masking on the role as far as understood. So you need to come up with some kind of custom solution. Snowflake is more enterprise grade versus Databricks, it's platform that requires more engineering effort. In terms of those enterprise grade features, it's still not mature enough, I think. How do you ensure observability in a production pipeline to verify it's working as expected, even without running test cases daily? Outside of Databricks, because I usually use DBT and it has great framework for the testing. So, um, the new pipeline is run, you, you run the test, you have the freshness test, all in this framework. That's very nice. Those are methods and ideas that DBT using for testing, they can be applied to anything, but you just need to write it manually. In Databricks, you can leverage like test, test driven development. So for every functions you produce in PySpark, you already can create the functions with assertion and make sure any change you have in Databricks going through continuous integration process where you actually running tests and you have dummy data or you might have like real production data to make sure it's not breakable. You can also set up additional jobs that will test the freshness. It gives you opportunity to use Python. It's very flexible. You can run a bunch of tests before you start your PySpark jobs and processing data frames. You can check, validate what's the freshness of the data that you're going to process, any kind of test. As soon as is it finished, you can run uniqueness test. You can check that some columns like not null, so or maybe in accepted list of the values, all could be applied to the data frame before or after or in the middle of the transformation. How do you set up monitoring for pipelines to identify issues as early as possible, both during code releases and in production? In terms of production pipelines, first, we can collect just the logs, how the pipeline works and is either succeed or failed. I work with Databricks on Azure and we use the data factory to run Databricks notebooks and the Databricks itself it's collecting all the logs and pushing them to the log analytics service where you can set up alerts in case of pipeline fail. At the same time, I did the POC with the custom jar libraries that I upload to the Spark cluster and it's pushing custom logs to the same log analytics service. And I think for Databricks, like service like Datadog or I don't know, Prometheus, Grafana, they can send all the logs, including custom events, and then you can create alerts on top of, of this. It's the question, how much information you are extracting while the pipeline is running? Because you have just the pipeline metadata itself versus any custom things that from inside pipeline you can write to somewhere. Given a fact table with columns for time, user ID, device ID, platform, app version, and location, how would you use Skull to identify anomalies in location collection frequency between app versions, potentially caused by bugs in the mobile app that affect how often location data is collected? First of all, I will just simply discover the tables by running, trying to profiling this by app version and just to see how many like distinct app versions I have, how many users they have, then make sure that user can have only one app version at a time to see how many devices user might have, how many platforms it might have. First of all, I need to identify 
for user. I have the current version that we just upgraded and the previous version. The next for the previous version, I need to estimate, uh, I don't know, the frequency of data we getting based on the number of events we getting. And, and maybe because we have longitude, maybe this data also, also makes sense that make sure that the user should still like having the same location more or less. As soon as we upgrade the next version, I can compare this. If we have time, I can do find the average for the previous version for each user. I can find average number of events per, per minute, per hour, and then do the same with the new version and compare the result. So I have these. Um, okay. So I can find, uh, and I assume I can simply use this to find the last version for the user. It, it depends what's the version we have. So I can call this as, uh, so this result produced the um, last version. Then what I can do, I can find, also I would find, uh, basically for this app version, I can find the timestamp, then it, I don't know, do I need this or not, but I can find the event uh, time of upgrade. And then here I will basically join events table uh, with uh, this table. For each user, I only get events uh, that uh, has particular version. And I will find, so, for, and this just give me the app version and the timestamp that was upgraded. So I know uh, what will be my time frame that I can evaluate the last version, like whatever I want to calculate, either average number of events or just number of events, median number of events. The, the next thing I need to do is to estimate previous. I need to find the previous version for each user. And also I need to find event time for previous version. So here, I assume that my time frame is uh, this time of upgrade to last version uh, versus now. And here, result of this um, of this city, all combined those two cities, I should have the user ID, previous version ID, and time of beginning and time of ending to know exactly how long this version was. What I want to also calculate, so I can calculate metrics for user previous version, where I can uh, calculate the events like number of events uh, per minute, number of events uh, per hour, what else I can do. Yeah, maybe some other things, um, why is platform? In terms of latitude, longitude, maybe I can try to see is, is this change or like how frequently, you know, frequent frequency of what one, like, or some kind of behavior uh, related to geographical data. And then same, I can do calculate metrics for current version and then as a result, if I will have basically for each user, I will have the current up versions, all the metrics, the previous up versions, all the metrics, and all in one row. That's my goal to get this all in one row. Then I can start compare like average to average, minute to minute, hour to hour. No, I think all good. Thank you. Bye. You too.